Good morning, great to see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to Big Questions. Today we're live from the Students' Union at Northumbria University in Newcastle upon Tyne. Welcome everybody to the Big Questions. <laughs> On Wednesday, the Education Secretary Justin Greening announced that all schools, including academies and private schools, must provide age-appropriate sex and relationship education. From the age of four, all children will be taught about relationships between adults and what is appropriate behaviour between children and between adults and children. And in secondary schools, sex education lessons will cover today's fastest growing risks, sexting, cyberbullying and online pornography. Should porn be on the school curriculum? Um, Claire, hi Claire, Claire McGlynn, Law School, Durham University. What is it about the modern world, how things have changed, that means that schools really have to refocus and address this? Well, the guidance that schools have on sex and relationships education is 16 years old, so it's completely out of date. So we are very much welcome the government's announcement this week. We need to be giving guidance and help to our young people to talk about what you mentioned, consent and sexual relationships. We need to talk to them about this online world that is so new to all of them and that many parents don't understand about sexting, about online pornography, about cyberbullying. And really importantly, we need to give them this guidance because this is one part of a broader strategy to try to reduce the prevalence of sexual harassment and violence against women and girls. Mm, which we're, we're... <laughs> on, on this particular issue of focusing on these lessons and sexting and cyberbullying uh, bullying and porn, Jill Robbins, this is about equipping children to deal with the world as it is. Not the world as you would like it to be, Absolutely. or the world as it was. Absolutely. Um, I don't think anyone would disagree that we need to be equipping children. But um, there are some questions around what's actually going to be in the curriculum. We don't know yet. The content hasn't been published. Um, but as soon as the announcement was made, there was quite a strong campaign to remove the parental opt-out and um, quite a campaign to say that the religious um, protection of religious education should be removed. Isn't there a problem, though, that those who would opt out and would take their children out of these classes are perhaps disproportionately the very parents who would be less likely to address these issues at home? I think that's possible, but then the question is, how do we empower parents to have those conversations? The evidence is very clear that parents want to have these conversations with their children, and children would prefer to have those conversations with their parents as well. Parents don't know what to say. They don't know how to have the conversations. In terms of online threats, their children are much more techno-savvy than they are, and they don't know how to deal with it. So one of the things that I will be um, campaigning for while this debate is going on is what are we doing to empower parents as well as empowering students? And also what are we doing to secure the family? Because the biggest influence on any child when they're growing up is their family. And I don't actually see anything in these proposals that say we're going to be talking about building strong families. The government's own evidence... Building strong families in what sense? Tr stronger kind of traditional families? Um, just strong families where adults love their children, where children can learn to love and be loved and trust and be trusted. Places that are safe for their children to go to. Well, on to that. Go should wrong. there be a parental opt-out, Claire? I don't think there should be, no. I think we, what we've got to do here is think about the child's rights. What about rights. religious sensitivities? Yeah, but this is for the children. We ought to all our children to give them the education, the guidance that they need to deal with consent, sexual relationships in the online world. We can't let parents opt out of this because we need to give the, the skills to the child. And also, if we are going to reduce sexual harassment and sexual violence, you can't opt out of that because it, everyone needs to know about consent. Everyone needs to understand what's necessary in consent and sexual relationships. So we can't have an opt out about it. But I think you, there are, sorry. You, uh, I uh, think you absolutely have to have a parental opt out simply because, you know, the child is the child of the parent. The parent should have as much control as possible over their children and should decide these things. Uh, you know, to say that the state should have the you know, ability to override a parent, whether it be religious reasons or just personal reasons, to take their child out of sex education is, you know, is frightening. That's a frightening prospect to say that the state should have more control over what kids are taught than their parents. I think this is about a collective responsibility, actually. It's collective responsibility on all of us to educate our children and young people on these issues. And therefore, we can't have parents just opting out of these choices. What do you mean about the sex culture, the, the rape culture that people talk about now? 
uh, you know, male, male violence towards women. Do you think that needs to be addressed at school and in what way? I think that's a fantastic place to start it because um, we have sexual violence and sexual harassment in our schools and in society generally. And, and this was a, there's comprehensive um, evidence was put before the cross-party um, select committee on this issue. It is a problem and the best place to start it is education mm -hmm. in our schools. This is part of a gross panic, a really gross panic about the levels of sexual harassment. We certainly don't have huge levels of sexual harassment at school. We're talking about teaching four-year-olds about some, like, adult issues and really actually worrying children about things that they shouldn't be. This new call for greater sex education with um, things about pornography and sexting and relationships is a way of problematizing sex much more than it was before, you know, making sex such a big deal for kids Liz, that they are panicked and frightened about yeah. them before they a second. Liz, Liz, you're, no, you're, you're, no, you're, you're no. moving so much in your chair, I'm yeah. worried for the Body language. safety of the furniture. <laughs> Audience in a second. Liz. Um, the reality is, I mean, we deliver relationship and sex education to 24,000 children and young people each year and more than 2,000 parents. The reality is very, very few parents actually withdraw their children from relationship and sex education, especially when they understand what it covers. Um, we send out letters to say that we will be working with three-year-olds up to 18-year-olds and that from four, age four we will be covering issues such as pornography, sexting, such as that. This brings in loads of parents because it's like panic, as you say. What on earth are you going to be covering? Over to the experts. Yeah. But when they see the age-appropriate resources that we use, parents are completely at ease because they understand that the world that we're moving into is very, very different from when they were at school. Casper, what are you shaking your head for? Oh, oh, uh, put your hands well, up in the audience. Well, you to, I would definitely want to, my, to opt out um, for my children because I actually think the agenda behind a lot of this stuff that's being suggested to, to be taught and is being taught is a really degraded notion of what it is to be human. It actually implies that all men are a problem a lot of the time. It problematizes normal sexual behavior. It's actually really outrageous and, and really disturbing. And I don't you want mean young children to be taught to think about people in that way. What do you mean it problematizes? That's a, a, a great verb. Well, I'm going to take that one away. <laughs> what do you mean it problematizes <laughs> normal sexual behavior? Well, basically, it encourages young people to see everybody else as a potential threat, mm. to see all sexual activity as potentially dangerous, and it's a really unhealthy way of looking at the world. We look, it's, it's certainly not we look at all the child, We look at all the child abuse cases in the past, which are horrific and horrendous, and any right-minded person is, is, is brought to, to tears reading about it. Mm. If those... I mean, Dan, let me throw that this Stephen the Catholic Herald. I don't mean to particularly point it at you for that reason but you know the catholic church has had huge problems and maybe if children were empowered they knew what it was right to touch what it was not right to touch what was right what was wrong what somebody should not be doing to you taught from a very early age that would have stopped some of these horrors in the past visited on them by clerics you're right we can't do enough to safeguard children and the catholic church is one of the institutions which has failed at that in the past but I think when it comes to sex education, we have to accept not everyone agrees about the guidance that's given. Mm. Brooke, who are one of the leading providers of guidance on sex education, as part of their definition of healthy sexual development, include for 13-year-olds having sex with those of a similar age and developmental stage. Now, you may agree with that, but I think a lot of parents would believe that they would want to opt out of that. And that's why it should go back to the parents and not to what are often quite radical agendas being pushed. Into radical agendas. No, hang on. We'll get, we'll get on to the radical agendas, uh, <laughs> alleged radical agendas, actual radical agendas in a second. Let's hear from the audience. Some hands went up. Good morning to you. Is this appropriate in school from a very early age? I would say it definitely is. And just going back to a point um, raised earlier, I'm really surprised as well to hear from a, a young girl like myself that um, she doesn't believe that there is sexual harassment in this day and age. There certainly is. I know International Women's Day is coming up soon and in preparation for it, um, a teacher at my school asked a group of girls together to ask about our opinions and our daily experiences of sexual harassment. Does it exist? Is it just kind of like a few? And it, and it certainly does exist. And it's surprising... Can good education at a very early stage and in fact through primary school and secondary school uh, militate against that? 
Certainly. Mm -hmm. And I think that people who believe that um, teaching about porn at school will uh, somehow people are going to then imitate it is certainly not true. And if you believe that porn is dangerous, then there is more reason to teach about it, just like we educate. teach about drugs at school. We can't um, educate ourselves out of a social problem. We don't, okay. Yeah. We really have to kind of take a step back and see that there is such a kind of really a, a hype and a panic around sexual harassment and sexual assault, which is inflating stats and is really untrue. And the biggest losers in this conversation are women and are young girls, um, the young girls that are taught educate, sex education in this very panicked, very kind of frightened way, because what it teaches them, as Casper said, is to see all sexual relations as problematic. They're taught to kind of tick box for things like consent and stuff like that in a very unnatural way, which makes them kind of grow up to be women who encounter sexual relations as a potential threat, as a problem, rather than a great part So there's part a kind of, of notional, formalised codification form that you have to... Absolutely. You know, yeah, over there. Yeah, hi. Good morning to you. It was quite um, interesting how one of it was going on about uh, making good families, because I find it important that school should be a safe place for children, mm. especially if you're from a broken family, mm. if you're from divorced parents, and both parents don't have that communication to talk to what to one another about um, sex education and it is left completely by itself so you have children who have no support from parents who don't want to talk to one another about sex education and they only see school as a safe place or a safe environment where they've got this kind of antagonistic behavior at home um, so they rely on their teachers and people who they see five times a week um, for the good part of like eight hours a day. So they rely on teachers, especially from a, a very young age. I think it's incredibly important to have sexual education in schools. Just one more there. Yes, sir. Very quick one. Let me come to... Uh, so uh, I think yeah. uh, whilst it's important to have this, but this ought to be done in very close cooperation with parents. Because if parents feel that they're left out of this initiative, then I don't think it can work. Okay. Uh, I look, completely I'm agree with I that. I think I called you Liz earlier, and I do apologise, okay. but you just went on regardless, which is exactly <laughs> the right thing to do. <laughs> so, Lynette, tell me about a three-year-old. What is appropriate for teaching a three-year-old or a four-year-old and uh, how that is done? When we go into primary schools, we work with the nursery children first, and it's just a little session, it takes about 10 minutes, and we show them little drawings of a little cartoon boy, cartoon girl, to explain that boys' bodies are different to girls' bodies, and their bodies are private, and nobody should touch them unless they want them to. And we go through the four areas that nobody should touch unless they want them to, which are the mouth, the chest, Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina, and their bottom. And we get them to do the actions, and they think this is great fun. Um, but before we do any of that work, we always work with parents, and parents really welcome seeing all the resources, everything that what, we're going to cover. Why are you cover. looking horrified? I just think what? this is a what? terrible intrusion onto yeah. the innocence of children. And, you know, children play doctors, they kind of... It's actually a adults great Adults exploit part. innocent children. This is, we're not talking about adults, we're talking about children's interaction with, their, with themselves here. The previous point that educating children about where not to touch would stop adults who clearly have a, you know, abhorrent agenda is not the case. A, a small three-year-old is not going to be able to stop by doing that. A, an adult that is going to Can I just know, say, abuse them. Nothing takes away children's innocence. It does if you say this is bad and this abuse. is bad. Kids play. Kids play. Kids, the great thing about kids, the great thing about kids is they you know, figure out a lot on their own. They figure out a lot between each other and they play. They play doctors at nursery. They play all this kind of stuff. Lines are drawn and they work it out between themselves. You're, you're absolutely damning parents' own ability to Come. take care of their children and children's own ability to work it out oh, for yeah. themselves. Very surprising to see people that are very concerned about the family and about children denying children the power to protect themselves. I no. find that remarkable. And when people, say, when people say, oh, I think that should be for the parents, there is nothing about educating children in schools that stops parents from educating them at home what they're really saying is I don't want my children to know about this I won't tell them I don't want you to tell them because I feel if it's mysterious and scary 
they probably are not going to find out about it. They're not going to look into it. If you tell them about it, they'll be interested. They're going to look into it and find out about porn, about sexing, about relationships. And that is just not true. It is. Children uh, I mean, will find uh, out about porn. Casper. They, they, it they is, will, it just, it they is will Casper. enter into relationships it's scary with to each other. And it's they best that they know how to protect Okay, it's scary to tell a child that they should be worried about a person touching them. That's an adult responsibility. A three-year-old cannot protect themselves from that. That's the adult's responsibility. I think. Lord Scriven. It's not, about, it's not about a child being able to protect themselves. It's about the child having the knowledge to be able to go to an adult yeah. and seeing it as inappropriate. Absolutely. That's absolutely. And, and, and if they're not doing such a good job without the state, then we wouldn't have some of the scandals that we've seen. This is adding on to what parents do and protecting young people. It should be encouraged. Education's about giving the knowledge skills for people to go on into the world. And being aware of sexual exploitation is some of the knowledge that they need. Joe, what? I think there is an issue with the underpinning ideology of a lot of the campaigning. And as okay, I said, we don't know what the content is. Okay, we skated over that a little bit earlier on. What yeah. is the underpinning ideology? I think the underpinning ideology... I mean, you're from Christians in Education. So yeah, what, I think the underpinning ideology is that society should be able to... There's no right or wrong, there's no good or bad. Society should just do as it wishes and let's teach the children to defend themselves. Now, when we teach children how to cross the road, we don't teach them about different cars, we teach them that cars stop at a red light and they can cross safely. Why are we not talking about moral red lights amongst adults in society? What are they? So that our children can live Give safely. Give us an example of a um, moral red light. I haven't seen anything in the proposals yet about teaching young people about abstinence, about faithfulness and exclusivity within marriage. Why are we not teaching those as options? Uh, John, you made a strange face. <laughs> well, I, I, think I, it's... I, I do apologise if it was nothing to do with what was... Uh... <laughs> no, I... I... I think um, children have rights completely separate to their parents and I think it's been touched on already that sometimes parents do a terrific job and I think the programs that are described here can help parents to do a terrific job but children also have rights completely separate to parents and I think probably the, the, the program that's been talked about here is to enforce children's rights as separate individuals. What was it like for you growing up in Ireland? Yeah. Um, I think Ireland uh, my own case, I suppose, uh, ha happy enough, but Ireland generally um, was we had enormous problems um, with uh, abuse, particularly among the religious orders and so on, and it was a huge, huge problem. And also, I suppose, religious control of education in Ireland meant that a lot of people were abused uh, and there was no reporting system. Children were disabled from reporting, and a whole generation of adults, broken adults, grew up out would, of that system. Would, 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 would knowledge have been power? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Claire, what about this? Abs that's, that's, Jill's point. The bit Jill's I point. Buy. How can knowledge be, be power? I think the when, when you, they, 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 there is a, there is a difference in power. To tell power. an adult that they trust. You know, between a child and an adult. <laughs> an adult who abuses a child usually intimidates, lies, tells them that they're at fault, tells them not to tell anyone. All these things that you see in actual abuse cases. You're not going to protect a child by. Tell, telling them this stuff, and actually, what's, what's more to the point, you're not allowing children... It's a sinister children. manifestation of something that they pretend is love. It's that. That's, 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 that's what yeah, well, happens quite. all too and, often. And, and, and Claire, education Claire, has got nothing let's, let's to do take with back that. To abstinence. You're, you're missing the point about actually what's damaging about teaching people in this way. Let's take it back to abstinence children and fidelity. children have a terrible view of adults. Uh, and, uh, which is what a lot of people say. Fidelity and abstinence and constancy. Are, is, should that be taught... Well, th these are part of a discussion about relationships. And I think there's some real misunderstandings going on here. This is not about telling children what to do. The worst thing we would do with children is us as adults stand and say, this is what you need to be doing and this is how you do it. It's about giving them a forum to discuss these issues. And the young people, the young women themselves are asking us to give them these opportunities. And the bottom line is, if we don't educate them, they're going online, they're looking at the pornography online, as many of them do, and it's it's deeply racist, deeply sexist, often violent, sexualizes young girls and does not give a, a healthy view of sexual relationships. It's distorted. That's why, we have to, that's why we have to educate them about this because otherwise they're going to get that distorted view of what's going on. Who decides? Who decides what the content is? Who decides what our children should and shouldn't know? That's what worries me about all well, of the this. The internet decides, hence the sexting well, and the pornography I mean, and the cyberbullying. It's I, there. It's decided for them, isn't it? So it's a case of... No, it's, it's actually parents. Oh. I think we really need to stick up for parents. Yeah, There's been I a lot agree. of parent bashing because 
What we say when, we, when people um, argue for sex ed and they say, it's all very well, you know, my own family, I'm very good at talking about sex ed. There are lots of families, but there are other families out there that aren't very good about talking about sex education. That's where the school has to step in. And what you're really saying is that there are some parents who are sort of abusers, who are abusing their children no. by not teaching them about sex ed. And whether that's no. you know, religious parents or parents who just actually want to hang back and let their kids be kids for a little while. And, you know, you're, you're really damaging and intruding upon the very, well, no. the very important and special, you know, How family we... unit in which parents have control over their children. Linda, That's really look, worrying. Last word. You have the last word. I grant you the last <laughs> word. Uh, he it said pontification. How do we allow kids to be kids? It has got to be as all of us working together, schools, parents and specialist organisations, all working together to keep children safe. The one thing that we seem to have made the assumption about in the debate here is that where children are abused, it's adults. Mm. One out of every three child that is sexually abused is abused by another child. So it's about educating children to speak out to trusted adults, whether it's at home or okay. whether it's at school. Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for your interesting thoughts. Um, Good morning, great to see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to Big Questions. Today we're live from the Students' Union at Northumbria University in newcastle upon tyne Welcome everybody to the Big Questions. <laughs> On Wednesday, the Education Secretary, Justin Greening, announced that all schools, including academies and private schools, must provide age-appropriate sex and relationship education. From the age of four, all children will be taught about relationships between adults and what is appropriate behaviour between children and between adults and children. And in secondary schools, sex education lessons will cover today's fastest growing risks, sexting, cyberbullying and online pornography. Should porn be on the school curriculum? Um, Claire, hi Claire, Claire McGlynn, Law School, Durham University. What is it about the modern world, how things have changed, that means that schools really have to refocus and address this? Well, the guidance that schools have on sex and relationships education is 16 years old, so it's completely out of date. So we are very much welcome the government's announcement this week. We need to be giving guidance and help to our young people to talk about what you mentioned, consent and sexual relationships. We need to talk to them about this online world that is so new to all of them and that many parents don't understand about sexting, about online pornography, about cyberbullying. And really importantly, we need to give them this guidance because this is one part of a broader strategy to try to reduce the prevalence of sexual harassment and violence against women and girls. Mm, which we're, we're... <laughs> on, on, on this particular issue of focusing on these lessons and sexting and cyberbullying uh, bullying and porn, Jill Robbins, this is about equipping children to deal with the world as it is. Not the world as you would like it to be, Absolutely. or the world as it was. Absolutely. Um, I don't think anyone would disagree that we need to be equipping children. But um, there are some questions around what's actually going to be in the curriculum. We don't know yet.